vale, ya te haré tu turno, Adins, cuando vulguis. Ok, y están así todos. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. We are glad that you all are here for the third uh, day on this uh, conference. Uh, today, the uh, topic is uh, synthetic biology uh, processes that have to do with developmental with the development of organisms and the regulation of uh, genetic networks. Um, and we have a really nice panel of speakers. Um, all of them are really uh, well-known people doing excellent and, and fantastic uh, work. And the first speaker uh, is Ricard Solé. It's always a great pleasure to introduce Ricard, uh, all friend and collaborator. Uh, Ricard, uh, is both physicist and biologist, and did a thesis in uh, complex systems in ecology, and then has been working in many different uh, topics uh, that range from extinctions to virology, um, always with this nice combination of uh, modeling and real biological data. Um, Ricard is a CREA professor at the uh, and the PRBB and the GRC in Barcelona, and the Pompeo is all this mix of things together. And also an external professor of the Santa Fe Institute. Uh, with no more delays, uh, please, Ricard, go ahead and, and make us happy for one hour. Okay, thank you. Um, do you see my screen? Yeah, we see your screen. Okay, thanks, Santi. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to try to give you a, an overview of uh, kind of a picture that we're trying to build on, on understanding the nature of uh, major transitions in evolution, uh, inspired in, on the one hand, in theoretical and mathematical models, and on the other hand, on the kind of insight that can be uh, obtained from synthetic biology and in a more general uh, picture on synthetic alternatives to what we see in the real world. Um, the first thing I wanted to address is um, evolution is usually linked to uh, Darwinian selection and uh, that for, of course was one of the first synthetic theories of complexity, uh, but not everything is explained by natural selection. And in particular, uh, we still miss uh, a lot of understanding of the what's called the so-called so major evolutionary transition. So when some major innovation happens, uh, when uh, life appears, when cells emerge, when uh, multicellularity, uh, sex, cooperation, language, all these uh, big phenomena imply the, the emergence of a major innovation event, right? Uh, we do need theories for understanding that, and what, what I'm going to try to, to show you is that uh, theory and experiments provide a huge insight into that, whereas uh, they also allow to reformulate some of the questions related to these major transition events under a more theoretical perspective, where actually we can ask ourselves about whether or not there are universal uh, laws that might pervade uh, biology, but might be more general than biology, whether might be ordered for free. In other words, that the fact that some particular, sometimes mathematical, sometimes um, formal uh, rules that pervade almost every complexity that you can imagine, some order we see in nature is just a consequence of that, not of selection processes. And for example, whether or not we're going to be uh, define the space of the possible. So whether theory can allow us to actually define uh, the whole space of possibilities and understand what kind of uh, parts of this space have been explored by evolution. To this goal, we organized a, a couple of workshops uh, in the re in recent years at the Santa Fe Institute. Um, in particular, in one of the workshops um, that we ended up with this, uh, special issue in philosophical transactions that I edited on, uh, we defined the idea of synthetic evolutionary transitions, meaning what? Meaning that um, in the natural world, we have, uh, we see the transitions happening in the fossil record. We also uh, can gain a lot of insight in looking at the phylogenetics, see, see what the, the omics provide in terms of understanding what's the 
the timing of these these events. And an alternative way of approaching this, uh, what we call the synthetic approach, is that uh, thanks to a number of ways we can actually reproduce or recreate transitions in the lab using synthetic biology, using uh, evolutionary robotics, using uh, artificial life, plus everything, um, all the weaponry that is provided by systems biology and statistical physics uh, should be should be enough to actually uh, create uh, a new synthesis in terms of um, the idea that we can think in, in, in evolutionary transitions as phenomena that are dynamical, that can be uh, formalized, and that um, actually open a number of new questions. For example, since we can actually recreate or, or invent transitions in the lab, and I want to summarize a few examples, um, we can actually ask ourselves whether evolution happened in a particular way or uh, there's more general possibilities there. I, I'm going to explain that. And um, uh, most of the things I'm going to mention are in this uh, paper I wrote for this special issue where I tried to make kind of a big synthesis. First step here, and it's a, a number of conceptual issues that I think it's important to, to refer to. Um, whether or not evolution is a historical process, meaning what? Meaning that uh, whether history is absolutely relevant in terms of uh, an evolution that is path dependent. Um, to make the long story short, uh, this can be summarized in the following way. And Stephen Jay Gould, in a way, used that uh, kind of argument, thinking in the Cambrian explosion, the, the major revolutionary event that happened um, uh, 500 million years ago, a bit more than that. Uh, where essentially animal life was uh, all the potential organization forms we, we call the body plants of animals emerge in a in a in an instant in a geological instant um, gould refers to that event and uh, says well what would have happened if we were able to rerun the the tape of evolution uh, go back in time and run it um, and see he suggests that for a number of reasons uh, evolution is extremely historical and the biosphere we will observe today will be completely different, maybe unrecognizable. Is that the case? It seems a reasonable argument. Uh, that would be a kind of a historical argument. Uh, on the other hand, we see also in evolution um, and in general around us, uh, a phenomenon called convergence, meaning that many solutions that uh, evolution finds to given problems, for example, um, the, the complex eye that we have, has been invented independently many times and ending up with the same, exactly the same design. Um, another phenomena like multicellularity has happened independently many, many times, all again sharing a number, a number of apparently universal features. So this suggests that maybe very strong constraints to what can actually happen. And that provides a very different picture. Life Solution, this book here, is, um, is a very good recommendation here. Uh, with actually puts together these ideas of uh, convergent evolution, kind of a uh, repeated patterns that we see in, in nature in multiple scales. And Per Albert there uh, actually was one of the strong advocates of this, this idea, the idea that there are uh, really fundamental constraints to what's actually possible. Meaning that if that's the case, then maybe the biosphere is, uh, could be different, but would be very, very much recognizable. Another point I wanted to make, and I'll, I'll, we'll take that uh, later on, is the possibility that evolution doesn't happen as it, it was kind of the, the typical metaphor from the Darwinian uh, picture in a, gradual, in a gradual way. So it's not happening uh, slowly in time as a process of uh, selection and, mm -hmm. and uh, variation. Instead, there's this uh, idea that has been uh, gaining some insight, some, some momentum in the last uh, few years, uh, uh, the idea of punctuated equilibrium, that uh, change can happen quickly, right? And why that happens and the way it happens, um, it can have a, a diverse nature, right? I, I would like to actually point you into this uh, recent work in cancer. It seems that punctuated equilibrium, these explosions that, uh, of change that happen uh, apparently in evolution, it's, they seem to happen in cancer and that plays a very important role. There's a big number of questions that we cannot address uh, in an hour. Um, what's the role of universal events, chance, uh, tinkering, this 
such a fundamental feature of evolution that evolution always reuses what is there, whether or not optimality is, is there and in what way is there, right? The role of information, um, the role of previous conditions necessary for the transitions, whether or not transitions that we observe as a few in a class of transitions, I personally don't think so. And a point that I want to make also, uh, are uh, these major transition events something like phase transitions as we uh, define in, in physics? Let me point you into something that is belongs to this idea of synthetic transitions and is the possibility of actually uh, simulating uh, in a computer processes that we observe in evolution and what kind of lessons we can learn from that. And uh, Tom Ray, I think this is a, is a very neat example of why universals can actually be seen in the artificial world that supports the idea that might be uh, universals in general in evolutionary processes. Um, the short story is uh, Tom Ray, he's, he's an ecologist, a, a, a real ecologist, right? Um, he made this experiment in the early 90s, uh, or that now is a typical experiment of running within a computer uh, an evolutionary experiment. Um, in a very simple, in simple words is you take a bunch of programs, um, a, a population of identical uh, small programs um, with an, a single purpose. They want to replicate it within the CPU of the computer. So they compete for memory, right? But when they replicate, um, they replicate um, by removing some other program there. So it's a typical uh, process of competition and they can make mistakes. Uh, so mistakes, of course, uh, can imply that the program is, is unable to actually work. But from time to time, one of these programs was able to actually make this a successful mutation. And what Ray observed is that, first of all, there was a generation of programs that were more quick in replicating because they were shorter, which makes sense. If you are smaller, you are more able to replicate. Then um, he observed there were a, a new generation of programs coexisting with the previous ones that were faster replicators. But when he looked at the program and at the code, he saw that it could not replicate by themselves. So they were parasites. Then the, the parasites of the parasites emerged, what we call in biology hyperparasites. And then uh, sex emerged, uh, meaning that uh, to protect yourself against parasites, which recognize pieces of your code, one thing you can do actually is to scramble a little bit the code, right? That's what we call if you want recombination. And later on, uh, groups of uh, programs that were not pretty, pretty good, uh, each one uh, in isolation in replicating, were able to replicate fast be by, because they cooperate. And cooperation is, of course, a major force of evolution. That kind of ideas has been expanded over the last um, uh, 30 years in multiple directions, in particular, thanks to the work of Christoph Adami, who published this uh, very influential uh, book, uh, Artificial Life, years ago. And one thing I can tell you is that there's a number of things that you can observe of evolved uh, uh, organisms. There's also a, a big number of things that we haven't been able to do. And that uh, very, very often change is punctuated, right? That when you observe the, how fitness increases in time, it happens in sudden events. So let me go for a few examples, right? Uh, I can go into everything, but let's uh, recollect a number of ideas. Uh, first step is uh, in the origins, right? Uh, how life originated. Um, by definition, everything about pre prebiotic uh, life um, in the lab is synthetic. Uh, you, you decide what kind of thing you put together, that's the Miller experiment on the left, or this experiment uh, driven by uh, Carl Sagan and others on Titan's atmosphere. You put together small molecules, under uh, non-equilibrium conditions, and you analyze what's there. And as you know very well, it's a repertoire of uh, small molecules and, and sometimes not so small that emerge and that um, interestingly uh, connect with the repertoire of relevant biological molecules like amino acids or nucleotides. So what kind of transitions can we actually see there and formalize? One important transition before life. It's um, uh, curality. Uh, we know that life uh, living uh, beings use particular forms of two possible configurations, left and right, if you want, right? Um, from, from the idea that you put a molecule in front of a mirror 
and there are molecules that are, are chiral that show two kinds of two kinds of uh, possible configurations that cannot be um, that are not, are not identical. So life uses only one. There's a number of reasons why that happens, and there's been a, a big the debate about why some particular configurations, why amino acids are, are of, of one kind of um, uh, mirror shape and why nucleotides are the other mirror shapes. The consensus is that this probably is a, a, a frozen accident, although there's uh, some evidence that uh, some particular um, um, symmetry, so particular direction of that, it's maybe favored. But the nice thing here is that we can actually use that, uh, the idea of uh, selection in, and the conditions where you have a competition between two uh, mirror forms and show that there's symmetry breaking. Symmetry breaking here is the phenomenon where uh, if you represent with this potential function, uh, you can actually show that there are two main attractors that are completely symmetrical. There's no advantage in any of them as it will happen with this kind of molecules. And they are separated by an unstable point, the, the symmetric scenario, right? Um, that could be the case. That would mean that that particular uh, origins of a structure in biology will be uh, accidental, right? And it's pretty much the case that things that we also observe in other um, chiral systems like uh, shells, for example, where there's a, is a, is a majority of, um, I think it's right-handed right um, coiling, it's a consequence not of any kind of selection um, uh, selection driven event, but a chance event. There's another, it's another place where uh, transitions uh, are relevant. And um, this is the domain uh, connected with the original molecules that were able to carry information. And this was a major uh, result by, by Manfred Eigen and Peter Schuster in the 70s, where they, they showed that if you uh, analyze the mathematical properties of a population of replicators that um, replicate and mutate, they actually showed something really spectacular. You can actually think that in that in, in, a, in a hypercube where you have a sequences of molecules, uh, could be kind of the digital genomes here. Every single bit in every single uh, genome can mutate when you have replication with some probability, right? Um, and the question is, what happens in dynamical terms with this system? And they, they, they found out a very important result is that there's a limit, it's a threshold in the mutation rate that allows information to be preserved, right? A limit that when you cross the limit, and you can formalize that in, in a number of ways from statistical physics into um, uh, multidimensional dynamical systems. You can actually show that when the mutation rate uh, approaches the inverse of chain length, right? The system experiences this transition from uh, preserving information to losing information and being just random, so just random drift. The nice thing is that um, this, this um, um, prediction uh, was in the 70s, go way ahead from any kind of measure that was possible to do in, in genomes, seems to be confirmed by uh, data that has been analyzed. Typically, mutation rate uh, scales as the inverse of genome length, and this has generated a huge amount of uh, theoretical uh, results, right? Uh, we did something in the context of, of cancer, but the error catastrophe, and I'll point out that when we talk about language, seems to be kind of a, this generic kind of mathematical results that pervade uh, complexity. If you make a step, uh, a step beyond that, uh, one important thing that also seems to be very relevant in understanding the origins of complexity in prebiotic soups, if you want, um, requires something that is um, processes that allow particular molecules to be much more abundant. So uh, departing from the random mixture. And one way of doing that, uh, and that was proposed by Stuart Kaufman um, in the early 80s, is the idea of uh, catalytic cycles. Uh, meaning that what happened if you uh, belong to a, a cycle where uh, there's a, a catalytic uh, loop that connects every molecule within the cycle. And uh, Kaufman, uh, again, to make a long story short, suggested the idea that actually, if there's enough catalytic reactions at some point and enough diversity of molecules at some point, what we know very well from the statistical physics, we have percolation, 
uh, not only statistical physics, but graph theory, right? The classical graph theory of random graphs, you have a percolation threshold, meaning that um, if reactions, which will be connections in between elements in this, in this uh, potential soup are, are below some threshold, you essentially have a disconnected a bunch of things, right? Things uh, might react, but nothing really interesting happens. But once you get into the uh, critical threshold, enough connections are there, immediately you jump from non-system to system. So the concept, concept of system, now it's relevant. And uh, these autocatalytic sets uh, perpetuate themselves. You have what's called the closure. And that was suggested to be a really important part of what it's required actually as a precursor of living systems. And again, transition means a phase transition. This can be also formalized in a number of ways. Um, you can actually, uh, one of the best known examples, the so-called hypercycle, where you have uh, this uh, dependent replication uh, of uh, genomes within uh, uh, a closed loop. Uh, we did a lot of work with uh, Giuseppe on that. Uh, you can actually show that if you define that in the proper ways, um, you can talk about systems that are alive, be able to maintain in time this uh, autocatalytic set or not, and you are dead. Uh, Freeman Dyson did a, a beautiful work on that. One of the big uh, developments uh, currently is actually bringing thermodynamics, because that's something I will emphasize. Thermodynamics is pretty much absent from most of these models. And we, we do need uh, these, these ideas uh, to actually have uh, bounds for what's possible, right? With Jordi Pinero, we did some um, early work on this, on the linear replicators. And if we keep going, uh, one of the beautiful examples of how different ideas, different conceptual ways of understanding uh, major transitions uh, as uh, bifurcation or transition phenomena is the code, the genetic code. Why do we see the genetic code that is completely universal, that is everywhere for every single organism in the planet? You know, we know it's a small, slight uh, changes and exceptions, but essentially we do have that. We have DNA uh, as the molecule that actually uh, carries the, the role of information molecule. Um, I wanted to emphasize that Erwin Schrodinger, mm -hmm. a physicist years ahead again, of molecular biology had this beautiful intuition that if anything works as a molecule that has to play this role of um, the carrier of information, and at that time, as you probably know, it was a debate, it was DNA, it were proteins. He said, well, whatever it is, it has to be uh, an aperiodic crystal. Um, we know now what that means. Uh, when DNA was discovered, we see that it's a crystal, it can be crystallized, has this, a strongly regular component. It, the, the regular uh, the double strand uh, organization, but it's essentially aperiodic because within that you have the repertoire of uh, a set of symbols that can be combined in huge number of ways. So essentially you can go into infinity very easily. I want to point out that two important things. One is that uh, the genetic code seems to be optimal in one sense. If you actually uh, generate the millions of possibilities you can make mapping codons into uh, amino acids and see um, how robust is that against mutations. Our genetic code seems to be pretty much one in a million. And on the other hand, it's also possible, and that's a word by, by Trusty. I, 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 I'm sorry, I forgot to put here the reference. Um, a beautiful work what he actually shows that if you uh, use information theory to actually see what makes the code optimal in terms of uh, uh, error load, diversity, and the, and the cost of actually doing efficiently the coding, there's a phase transition that actually defines uh, the domain where you actually identify all the properties seen in the genetic code. Again, seeing that that's what might actually be behind the evolution, the major transition towards the emergence of code. Let's go into cells. Cells is the, are the units of life, right? Um, again, I'm leaving aside a lot of stuff. Uh, I wanted to point out in this particular uh, story that I think that reveals, again, this idea of universals. Uh, for Neumann, um, for many of you, a uh, very well-known mathematician, he actually contributed to a lot of different areas from, from quantum mechanics to um, uh, logic, game theory, uh, you name it. Um, uh, at the end of his life, he died quite, quite early. 
um, he had this uh, interest in biology and he was actually thinking the possibility of finding out the formal conditions for a machine that was able to self-replicate, right? A really important question because a lot of discussion we have these days about biology and universal in biology has to do with the mapping between the machine and, and the living thing. And he ended up with this idea. If you want to have a machine able to self-replicate, you should have this. The machine should include a set of instructions that, that uh, in a way drive the process of replication, but this uh, will require actually to copy instructions with the whole story, right? Uh, and he found that he put names like duplicator, controller, constructor. Um, if you show that to, to any uh, biologist, any cell biologist or bi molecular biologist, he will immediately say, yes, that's what is in a cell. You have instructions in the DNA, which actually is the, 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 the set of instructions that drive the process of replication. But in the process of replication, where you have uh, regulatory systems, you have uh, polymerases, which are duplicator, you actually copy the instructions, right? That's very, very natural. Uh, but again, this is something that was suggested years ahead molecular biology. So why we find out that the real biology it's consistent with that, probably because that's the universal way that you require to actually build a real cell, right? Um, I'm going to go quick into that. Uh, building an artificial cell is a big challenge. Uh, we haven't yet get there. There's a lot of uh, work on that. This is the amorphous space that I, I've been working on, on the possible space uh, of cells, artificial cells also, uh, having special informational and metabolic complexity. And the candidates for that uh, are most of them coming from theory, right? I wanted to emphasize two things we did in, in our lab. One is that uh, with Harold Fellerman here, um, we found out that you actually build a physical model, and I'm going to also emphasize that the embodiment is really, really important, a physical model that actually brings uh, a scenario where you have uh, a bunch of lipid molecules, right? That can form micelles or closed compartments. That's something that physics uh, favors as a minimal energy configuration. And precursors that can, molecules that approach that kind of micelle and react and become more lipids. Essentially what we show is that the physics of the process actually shows in a natural way how this growing system, right? Uh, that they maintain out of equilibrium by a constant um, introduction of, uh, of precursors can grow, destabilize, and replicate. And the good news for that is that it suggested that it could have not worked, but it suggests that actually under the right conditions, it should be possible to actually see that happening. We invented other alternatives with Javier uh, Macia. We actually suggested that you can use Turing mechanisms to actually destabilize one of these protocells to actually make them uh, grow and replicate, right? And we are working now with Artemi Kolchinsky and also Jordi Pinero in a, in a kind of theoretical framework. Also, this is really much missing on uh, a very important part of the story, which is cells um, are not only carriers of matter and energy, they also carry information and process information. And under what conditions that happened? When information became relevant, when that transform it into computation. And we just um, ended up formalizing that with using stochastic thermodynamics. And we think we have been successful in actually showing the bounds for that. And that's one particular thing that I wanted to emphasize. It's a lot of things that have not been explored beyond this vesicle picture. We have been all the time thinking in vesicles that are spherical compartments. Um, <clears throat> we developed a lot of theoretical modeling for that. But actually, it's a whole space of the possible that might have predated the origin of the first cells. And there's a lot of mathematical and, and statistical physics modeling required there. And, and for, for example, one thing that I think is really, really important is that there's a whole space of possible um, physical configurations of uh, soft matter beyond vesicles, um, and, and uh, which involve all kinds of uh, structural patterns that might play a really relevant role. Is that this is a particular uh, paper in physical new letters where uh, kind of amorphous space for uh, prebiotic vesicles is analyzed. I think it's very, very inspiring. 
how far are we from the synthetic protocell? Uh, well, it's difficult to know. Uh, I have learned over the years of not saying uh, in the five in the next five years we will do it. Um, I don't know. But there have been a lot of advances. I just wanted to point out this paper by Lee Cronin, um, which has been probably the most uh, successful scientist in approaching that. Um, these kind of things that he created in the lab, very important by using uh, experimental setups where evolution is used, right? And natural selection by using kind of artificial intelligent platform, they evolve uh, droplets of lipids that actually can self-replicate. So that's probably the best step in that direction. Um, let me skip this. And I want in, in each of these areas uh, point something that in my opinion is missing, right? What is missing here? Well, the, the thermodynamics of the models of protocells because thermodynamics is relevant as a constraint by itself. Um, having in mind that if you want a protocell to grow and, and replicate, it needs to go, to go into negative curvature um, scenario. Most mathematical models have been developed over the last uh, 40 years on re replicating cells. Ignore the physics, ignore the, the requirement of moving into this uh, situation where a explicit membrane has to be used, but that's very, very important. How replication and computation is connected and when gene-based control uh, takes, takes, act, takes the actual control of replication, right? Jumping into multicellularity, right? Um, multicellularity has happened at least 25 times independently in evolution, so it's, it's likely to be something, so to speak, easy to happen, right? Um, we have actually in the lab a number of examples of uh, that approach the idea of synthetic multicellularity, some really successful stories that you can actually force unicellular living uh, entities like yeast into becoming multicellularities. That's something that's been done in, in William Radcliffe's um, lab in Georgia, Georgia Tech. And we have also explored that. And I wanted to point out that um, the reason we think that uh, there's probably very strong constraints into what kind of multicellular organization might emerge comes from the fact that we, when we analyze the requirements in early development, the requirements for um, achieving a number of structures of separating cells uh, of different classes, of creating polarity, of uh, uh, changing the shapes of a given, uh, for example, spheroid, require mechanisms that are very, very fundamental in physical terms, in even mathematical terms, right? Uh, symmetry breaking uh, and all the kind of phenomena. And I wanted to also uh, emphasize that that was an idea that came from theory a lot of years ago, right? In the in the 70s, uh, for example, George Oster and Per Albert published this paper where um, they actually put uh, the attention that if you create models, mathematical models, where you have uh, growth uh, in a developmental process, but also physical interactions, right? That can deform cells. A lot of the structure that you can observe in, in uh, uh, growing systems, uh, formation of gastrula and all kinds of phenomena are easily to get there. Let me show you an example that we developed of uh, how powerful is this when you combine um, processes that involve reaction and diffusion with the physics, right? One particular thing that we know very well uh, also from the 70s is the following. Imagine you take uh, two types of cells, right? Um, that have different adhesion properties and that you put them together, starting from a random configuration. Well, depending on the matrix of interactions, the forces of interaction, how likely is that I want to be with you and not with the other kind of cell type, it's very easy to show there's a number of configurations that emerge from that, right? Like for example, uh, as you can see in these in this, uh, pictures there, um, two separated but connected blobs, uh, one population uh, surrounded by the other. There's a, multi a multiple number of possibilities that were just driven by physics, right? And we know that happens in biology. There's also early experiments, even, even uh, in, the, in the 20s, 30s, 50s of the past century, where you take an embryo, you disaggregate, disaggregate everything, you put the cells together and they just rearrange and form again the embryo. That's for simple life forms, right? Uh, like Hydra or uh, things like that. So what happened if you add into that particular thing, uh, the simplest way of defining 
multicellularity, which is what's called phenotypic switching. Meaning that imagine every single cell can adopt two kinds of configurations, right? Uh, involving the expression of different genes, okay? And that they can switch from one to the other, maybe uh, under a kind of stochastic switch. Well, we, we put that all together. Uh, I'm going to explain very, very quickly. Imagine you have two kinds of cells. One cell replicates, uh, it takes nutrients, the one here from uh, an external uh, reservoir. There's another cell type that um, is also taking the, these resources, but then there's this, the, the other component uh, too, which is a toxic molecule, right? Something that is a source of stress and can kill cells. So um, normal cells will actually uh, suffer from that, right? They, they might die. Uh, imagine it has a, a kind of cell type that resulting from this switching that is able to actually uh, reduce the amount of the toxic, right? It can actually metabolize. If you invest energy in that, you're less likely to replicate. So in that respect, it's not, it's not a disadvantage. But now, what happens if you evolve that? You evolve this situation from cells that do not interact, right? And do this kind of um, uh, double sword thing, right? Use the resource, metabolize the toxic. And what do we observe? is that that's work done uh, by with uh, Saba Duran and, and other co-workers of mine, um, something really amazing happens. It's uh, the emergence of a complexity, a class of complexity that has not been observed previously, where you actually observe this kind of uh, systems where uh, you create conditions by organizing the two types of cells in complex structures. Uh, you organize the system in an inside in an outside, right? Um, we call that proto-organisms. Why is that? Because it's not real organisms. You, have, you don't have a genome and you don't have a life cycle in the standard way, but clearly they organize in a higher order structure as a consequence of the necessity of actually living in this complex environment, right? Um, we have been conjecturing on that about this as a potential precursor of multicellularity. Um, is there a way of actually, that was a complex computational task because you, as you can see here, you use uh, reaction diffusion equations, uh, but we also evolve the matrix of interactions. Um, it's not trivial to see how to explain that in mathematical terms. We recently with Aina Oye uh, Vila, we actually find out a way of uh, defining a meta model of that, a mathematical model. We actually reduce the complexity, not considering space and showing that actually you can uh, mathematically prove that there's a, an indirect cooperation, right, between the two uh, types of cells that actually explains the success of this particular configuration. So what is missing here? And one thing that we also try to do is to actually present in a unified way the idea of the space of synthetic multicellularity. A lot of things have been happening, uh, simple experiments, artificial life experiments, um, synthetic biology designs, right? A lot of computational work. Um, this is a space where you have ecology, evolution and development. So we also consider the really, really important part of the story, which is that things need to develop. Uh, and that's what makes the genotype phenotype mapping so complicated, right? Um, a lot of things can be located in this space, including things that we've been doing in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, the Xenobots that were just uh, uh, emerged from the, in the last uh, two years. But there's a, it's a big part, big chunk of this space that is essentially unexplored. Why is that? Because uh, evolving in the lab uh, things that also uh, develop, uh, combining uh, development and evolution in, a, in an evolutionary way, in synthetic ways in the lab is really hard task. But also it's a hard task for the model. It's a lot of stuff that has to be done, right? What is missing? a model that actually explains this transition in the Cambrian, um, a real theory that explains the when genetic control of multicellularity emerges. Embodiment is extremely, extremely important and we need to really connect eco, the ego and the ego. And what else? In the, for the last part of my, my talk, I wanted to mention uh, one of the difficult parts of the story. Um, what about information? Information is extremely important in biology, of course. And computation as one of the instances of seeing information 
uh, it's probably something that plays a really, really relevant role in defining the universals and making a theory. This is a, a paper by John Hoffield. It's not very well known by most people, where he actually makes the point that what makes physical entities different from biological entities is precisely computation, meaning that biological entities uh, involve agents that are able to take information from the environment, process the information, and respond to that in adaptive ways. So um, is cognition a major transition? Um, probably several transitions are involved here, but as Eva Jablonka and Marion Lamb pointed out in this paper, clearly the, the moment in which agents uh, incorporate and manipulate information is a major decision in evolution, right? And that's something that has to be uh, explained. In one particular instance, because there's a lot of things involved here, is the suggestion that one particular mechanism that is involved in cognition, extremely relevant, uh, was probably one of the first things that changed everything in terms of cognition. Have in mind that cognition implies that you have, you require a, a network, a brain maybe, right? Uh, to the least a, a, a network that processes information and that has a cost and if you just want to replicate you might not need that so if this computation gives you an advantage it has to be a big advantage so um, associative learning is this process where you actually have two kinds of signals one that you naturally uh, associate with uh, an output right this is famous Pavlov experiment um, and there's another uh, signal that is not linked with this kind of output, but you can actually, by a process of conditioning, you can make any given agent, like a dog, for example, to react, right? That's very interesting, and that's uh, at the, on the basis of many other computational processes that happen in evolution. Um, and one thing that we showed in this paper with, um, with Javier Macia and, and Blay Vidiella uh, was the, the possibility of actually implementing that using synthetic biology. And we ended up with specific designs for that. Um, the mathematical and the bifurcation analysis reveals that you can actually build associative learning using synthetic biology, something that we want also to implement in our wet lab, in the real lab. You can actually show that you can uh, design a genetic circuit um, where actually you can show that it, it can learn to make this association and it can actually forget. So the whole pack in the, in the same thing. Interesting point to make. We have designed that using uh, a cell consortium. So we don't have one agent doing that, but you have at least two, could be three agents, different cells that we have engineered. And that's an interesting point because it, that means that this is not what you, we see in the real evolution, right? You have either one cell that does it or a multicellular system. We have done that synthetically. Again, opening the door, in the possibility that there are more things actually to build there that was put in biology. And finally, language. Language by many scholars, it's considered the most difficult transition. Uh, explaining language is far, far from trivial. Language uh, allows to actually jump beyond inform genetic information and going into a, a domain where agents can actually uh, define the external world, interact with the external world and with other agents in extremely flexible uh, ways, right? With new forms of memory. For language, uh, again, to make the long story short, there's a lot of theory that has been developed. Interestingly, if you think in language uh, in terms of an evolving entity, many people think in language as a, as a virus that infects the minds of kids. Language is a structure that involves words, words has to have to be transferred between agents that means that you have a, an information channel you have shannon's limits um, and you can think in language as a system that evolves precisely under the constraints of information um, not surprisingly perhaps using both game theory and information theory it's been possible to show that uh, mathematical models where you can show that the system collection of agents evolves coherence which is a very important requirement you have to end up with a set of symbols that we all share to refer to the same external world right um, you end up with a, a, a system of equations martin novak uh, david krakauer have been particular uh, important names in this context um, you show that it's a quasi-species equation so you have a system where there's a mutation rate that is connected with the possibility of making mistakes 
And it's shown that actually this error is important to actually evolve language. And you can show that the phase transition or a bifurcation from a non-coherent language, not, non, not shared repertoire into a, a single uh, connected system, right? We have explored that also in terms of, uh, of um, language diversity. Again, you can define uh, mean field theories for that, very neat. And <clears throat> another thing that we also did based on information theory many years ago with Ramon Ferrari Cancho was actually to find out um, a potential way of explaining one of the universals that we see in language. Language, um, there's a number of features of languages. Uh, we have a, a huge diversity of different tongues in our planet which unfortunately I, are, are getting extinct, many of them. And one uh, very general law that we see that has been, uh, been expanded in the last uh, 20 years by, by network theory is the presence of this law. This, when you put in, in, in a statistical framework, how often every single word in a, in a large text in a conversation is used, it follows a very heterogeneous distribution, the Zips law, which essentially it says that there's a, a few, uh, there's a handful of words that are used very, very commonly. Uh, the vast majority of words are rare, and that seems to follow a minus one exponent with some slight variation for all languages. <clears throat> and we actually show that it's possible to explain um, one explanation of this uh, can be obtained by assuming that, as uh, suggested by Zip that uh, there's a compromise between the cost of the speaker and the hearer, because language is something that they share between at least two agents. If I want uh, a language to be efficient, I have to reduce the effort of the speaker who wants to use the smallest repertoire of words to refer to the whole universe of uh, external um, objects, and the hearer who wants, to, wants precision, wants to understand what the hearer is talking about, and he wants the, 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 the speaker to use a very specific one-to-one -one matrix of um, symbols connected to, uh, to objects, right? So there's a compromise because it, it requires efforts from both sides. And, and, and we actually show, and we've been expanding that for the last years with several collaborators, that actually it's a phase transition, separating a domain where the speaker will, will be uh, kind of the winner strategy. I use one, two, three words to refer to everything. Very inefficient for the, for the uh, hearer. And the hearer phase favored, where we actually have the one-to-one -one mapping. At the phase transition, we observe um, elements of the Zips law. And we actually ended up with a pretty nice mathematical um, uh, explanation of that with Bernard Columinas, who is now in Austria. Um, showing that Zip's law is a kind of a generic processes that will emerge under, under this kind of basic uh, least effort principle. This is one of my favorite examples of synthetic language because that's the question you can ask for self, uh, yourself. Uh, what about synthetic alternatives, right? And one way of doing that is by evolutionary robotics, by using robots that can communicate between them, can actually uh, be programmed to uh, invent words, to refer to the external world, reach an agreement, right? But the beautiful uh, outcome of that, and he's Luke Stills, who is uh, the, the, the pioneering scientist who actually invented the first experiments, the so-called talking heads experiment, is that at the end of the experiment, you find out something unexpected, which is that a protogrammer has also emerged, right? The protogrammer was not in the programming, right? But something that was evolved by the robots as a necessity for actually properly communicating. What is missing? Well, we still don't have a theory for the understanding of the basis of language. That's pretty much missing. We don't have that. Uh, we need to understand the preconditions. There's a lot of discussion about what is required to actually bring complex language in place. Um, connecting the multiple language networks, semantic, uh, syntactic, et cetera, et cetera, right? And again, as we're saying, evolving synthetic languages. But more important and finishing, is something that is really fundamentally missing in complex systems uh, theory in, in general for our understanding of, of complexity in, in evolution. Language is pretty, pretty good example. Um, in language, particularly physicists, we have been finding out a number of universals, a kind of, kind of emerging universals. So uh, Zip's law, the architecture of language networks um, suggests that there are strong constraints, right? 
But there's a theory that was built many years ago. Uh, I put Chomsky's here. The hierarchy is a, is, a, uh, is a hierarchy for the kinds of grammars you can actually build, right? This seems to be a completely different thing, but again, it suggests universals. So what happens there? Why the two kinds of universals are not yet connected, right? I think that this is the big void that we need to fill. Um, and I think that one particular promising area comes from um, what's been developed by a number of researchers like Gemma de las Cuevas, with, with whom I am collaborating, in terms of seeing that when you look at mathematical or statistical physics models of spins, which is what is used many times to actually define emergent patterns, seems to actually be able to connect in a profound ways, in very formal right now, with uh, ideas from computation theory like the Turing machine. So, what I wanted to, sh to uh, actually show you is that it makes sense to think that uh, thinking in theoretical terms in the major evolutionary transitions fits well the picture of uh, bifurcation theory, phase transition theory, and that's not uh, just a formal connection, right? But, uh, uh, but instead, that the reasons why you observe uh, discrete qualitative changes in evolution um, driving the emergence of new, new novelties um, is deeply connected with this kind of phenomenon. And I put here a uh, recollection of past and, and, and current collaborations in totally random order. I've been uh, really uh, gifted to be uh, surrounded always with these really, really bright uh, PhD students and some uh, big scholars that uh, have deeply influenced my, my career. And that will be all. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ricard, for such an interesting talk and the review of, uh, of how things emerge from the very beginning, the most simple situations to the most complex ones. That has been a fantastic talk. Uh, we have a question from Patrick Goboni. He's going to set on his micro and, and ask you directly. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, hi, Ricard. I uh, discovered your work recently, and uh, um, uh, uh, am fascinated with uh, some of your uh, work. And um, I, I opened when I saw your Google Scholar page. I opened up thirty tabs right away. Um, anyways, uh, I was wondering how you uh, approach your research questions, like. Does it come? Does it come from a biological like inspiration? You pull in the physics. Does it start with the physics concept? And you push that into biology, perhaps, or like you start with like maybe a distant end goal such as multicellularity, and you break that down into subtasks. Um, so I was wondering if you have this sort of pattern or workflow, and. Do you find that that's different than your peers? And uh, I asked these two questions uh, as a from the perspective of uh, I I'm like a new, um, newly uh, entering the research field and was um, coming from the perspective of uh, do you have insight or advice? Right. Well, that's that's not a trivial question because uh, actually one of the one of the problems that we find out uh, well, it's not a problem really. But depending on the on the nature of the of the system, uh, it immediately drives you into considering. If I understand well your question, immediately drives you into first of all uh, define the question properly. So what do you want to understand? And uh, what I'm saying seems sounds trivial, but I find myself surprisingly uh, amazed by so so how so often people doesn't have a question. Uh, so the first thing is what I want to understand. I think the preconditions is a really, really important part of the story. Sometimes it's pretty much ignored. And when you look at the preconditions, it's where you actually realize how to approach the problem. When, when is uh, physics relevant? When is um, just going into the logic of the problem? Or sometimes when, when you, you have to go into, for example, information theory, so more into the logic of the, of the system, right? And, and I think also that one of the important points that has to be made uh, here that again even in, even within our community is not so well 
known is the the coarse graining so uh, when you move uh, into one level to another and you, you jump from one level to another because you have an, in, an innovation what parts of the of the first system of the level uh, where you originate um, can be ignored and why is that right why why they become irrelevant right and it's important also for formulating the models I don't know if I answered well the question because it was I, I couldn't hear very well what you said, but uh, I hope it was helpful. Yeah. No, it is, it is a very big question. I'm sure we could talk for much longer on it, but thanks for your answer. Right. Okay, Ricardo, you have another question from Ruben Perez Carrasco. Ruben, you want to... Oh, okay. Hi. So my question was about so all the models that you use when you are designing your minimal models for revolution and stuff rely on a uh, very simple polynomial kind of interaction terms which, which makes sense right you have like the most simple interaction between molecules it could be like a, like was a square but do you think there is place or this improvement could be made by taking into account other linear interactions that could come from space or how the molecule is shaped i don't know yeah 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 absolutely actually yeah i couldn't develop that in detail but the, the problem of embodiment and in particular, as I was very briefly mentioning, for example, the origin of, of protocells, uh, protocells that uh, were able to self-replicate. Uh, we found out that uh, actually when we started a project on that, a European project, the PACE project, where Josep was also involved, um, it was interesting to see that when our work was to define mathematical computational models of self-replicating protocells. And we thought that that was probably something that somebody had done before. And to our surprise, that was not the case. And we quickly understood why, because you need to actually uh, connect, uh, for example, the negative curvature that you need in the, in the membranes as part of the process of splitting. And, and that, as you said, is not just reactions. It's not just putting here two molecules that react in polynomial terms. And that's, that's a big challenge, but it's a, it's a beautiful challenge. And it's, it's plenty of really important questions there. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Gar. Uh, and there's a comment from David Alonso says, you stop at the evolution of language. Can you say something about the constraints affecting how language and resources drive the evolution of different type of social organization? Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, even bigger. that's not a, a trivial question at all. There's, there's also, of course, the, the emergence of cultural evolution, and which means the minds interact. And we do work with that. We have been working recently with a few collaborators on the emergence of agriculture and, for example, how a population of cognitive agents managed to, to deal with forest fires or fires in general. And this is quite interesting, quite surprising, the kind of results that you, you can go. But need, that needs another an hour talk, at least. So. OK. Uh, Frederic Bartomeus also has a comment. He wants to know your thoughts on the role of noise in all these transitions that you have mentioned. Oh, OK. Very important. I, I, I just briefly mentioned the, the noise uh, in the context of um, for example, the emergence of language, that's a very generic, I would say a very generic feature of most models of language evolution. You need noise to actually don't get trapped into local minima, right? Into simple, simple communication systems, for example. But for example, for um, evolving cognition, I think the noise is absolutely essential. That you need noise to actually, again, uh, on the one hand, not get trapped into, into these, um, minimal attractors, minimal energy attractors that are not optima. Um, and also, if you think now in the, in the domain of information in cells, information in cells, we know now that it's not just, the no noise there is not just something that you have to deal with. Noise can have a constructive role, right? And we recently, just to make some propaganda, uh, we recently, uh, completed and it's gonna appear in Nature Communications, a paper on, for example, how to bring the most extreme kind of noise within cells, within real cells using uh, what's called self-organized criticality, right? And noise, uh, that kind of particular kind of fluctuations 
is extremely relevant and appears in natural systems, in swarms, for example, uh, bird, flocks of birds, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and there is just last one question. Uh, this is going to be the last from Angel Garcia Casillas. Uh, he said that, that there is an, import, uh, an important part of the definition of a major transition uh, states that they bring qualitative changes in the way information is perceived, stored, or processed in systems. What emerging informational properties does multicellularity provide, for example? What, sorry, what kind of? What emerging informational properties does multicellularity provide? Well, multicellularity is, is totally essential for making a, a jump into really complex uh, gathering of information from the environment. It's not just um, the possibility of uh, specialization in cells for metabolizing things. Uh, one of the big successes of multicellularity, particularly at the Cambrian boundary, is that multicellularity allows to define new kinds of cells, which not only gather information from the external world and, and respond, but they allow the interneurons to actually make real processing and connect with sensors. And when you have sensing the world and uh, connecting them with inter internal processing, that's kind of the jump into infinity. You can do whatever you want. Okay. Thanks, Ricard. We have to finish here again. It was a great, great talk as usual. So uh, thanks. And thanks to all the uh, uh, people that make uh, questions and you know, participate in the discussion. So we're moving to our next speaker, which is Jordi Garcia Ojalvo, uh, also from the Pompeu Fabra University. Uh, Jordi is also a physicist by training, but after the year, he has been moving more and more into biological problems and has been done a lot of work in uh, both eukaryotic and prokaryotic bacteria consortia and how they communicate and evolve. So, uh, Jordi, whenever you are ready to enter with your, with your screen. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Santiago. Let me share. Okay, I hope that you can see. Awesome. Okay, great. So I'm going to turn on my pointer. Okay. Okay, I hope you can see also the red pointer. Uh, okay, good. So thank you so much, uh, Santiago, for the for the presentation. Also, thanks to Josep uh, Sardanes for uh, putting this conference together and for asking me to give a talk. It's really it's a, it's really a great pleasure. Okay, so what I would like to do uh, in the next few minutes is just to talk to discuss a bit about how. Um, uh, living systems, and this could be at the level of uh, single cells or, or collections of cells, if I have some time, going back to the discussion that we were having a minute ago with, with Ricard and with, An with Angel. Uh, so I would like to talk about how uh, living systems uh, process their dynamic environment. So in my lab, we have been studying for a while already the dynamic properties of living systems per se. But of course, the fact that the, that the living systems are dynamic and they adapt and they move around and they propagate through, uh, through the environment, this means that, the, that they are subject to dynamical environment. If you think this is a, a, a movie of a slime mold, and if you imagine that you are one of the cells in the front of the wave, you can see that the, the environment is constantly changing and you have to adapt to multiple of different kinds of signals uh, in real time. And the question is, how do cells do that? Okay. So anyway, this is a, just a nice video, the schematics of what's going on, maybe we could represent here in which a cell, or you could imagine not a cell, but a population of cells are, are subject to multiple uh, input signals. So that's why I mean when I say that the environment is multidimensional and also these signals are in principle dynamic. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the idea. So the question is how do living systems process this kind of complex information in the space and time? And uh, that's what I would like to address here. But before that, uh, I'm going to simplify a bit, okay? So I'm going to consider a very simple scenario in which the environment has only two states. And then the living, system, the living organism, for instance, a cell, has to distinguish, has to identify in which state it is, okay? So uh, here I'm using a picture which is reminiscent or it's very typical uh, picture of what machine learning researchers are working with in which you have different types of inputs, out one out of two, and then you have a classifier 
and the cell should be a classifier in that regard and then should determine whether the input is one or another. So this is a very simple unidimensional non-dynamic uh, uh, task. Okay, now how do cells do it? Well, and there are many ways in which cells do this and uh, Ricard has been talking about uh, many different, uh, uh, he has been talking about metabolism and other types of uh, biological processes. I would like to focus on simple gene regulation. So in this particular case, the input, the environment is basically modulating the concentration of certain proteins, which we can call transcription factors. These proteins bind to the DNA, to a sequence, to a part of DNA, which we call the promoter. And this promoter is regulating whether the gene is going to be expressed into a protein or not, okay? So in this process, as you can imagine, this is a very simple input output process. So here in the input, we will have some of these factors that are regulating the concentration of active transcription factor. For instance, in this case, it would be a sugar. Uh, and this is real results in E. coli, in the bacterium E. coli. And here you can see that when the sugar concentration changes, then the activity of the DNA promoter, which means the, 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 the rate at which the gene is being expressed goes from something which is close to zero to something which is close to maximal, okay? And it's a clear threshold behavior. So this is the simplest classification task ever. And in that way, you could say that E. coli is able to classify its environment in terms of whether there is no, there is no sugar or there is sugar by, activate, by activating the gene minimally or maximally, okay? So very simple binary tax, which I'm, going to inter, uh, which I'm going to represent in this very simple manner. I have an input node, if you will, and an output node. And this uh, arrow here is a simple threshold function like the one that we have here. Okay, but of course, as I was saying, this is a very simplistic situation. The environment is not usually unidimensional. So let's start complicating things. What happens if we have two inputs? So you could have, for instance, sugar, uh, this kind of sugar here, and also cyclic AMP, which is also uh, uh, telling you how much glucose and other sugar is in the environment. And E. coli is able to integrate these two inputs in the activity of the same promoter. And then you're going to have something like this, which is close to an AND gate, right? Both inputs one and two have to be present for the promoter for the gene to be expressed. And this is, this is a typical integration map. That's by no means a, a unique uh, situation. This can be studied in a very systematic manner in the same paper in the group, by the group of Buri alone from uh, 14 years ago. 13 years ago, we can see a whole variety of integration maps in which we have this corresponding to different kinds of uh, promoters that regulate the utilization of sugar by E. coli. And these uh, promoters are integrated into inputs and the way they integrate has this type of shapes. With, in many cases, we have unlike gates, but in other cases, we have some things which are more complicated. And in any case, what you have is two inputs that are acting on an output, and then you can have this different type of behavior. But what if we have a, a slightly more non-trivial, uh, or you, you, what if the cell needs some kind of no, more non-trivial classification? For instance, imagine a situation like this in which the cell needs to uh, determine whether the, in, the two inputs are at a certain intermediate level, neither too high nor too low. So this is kind of a, a classification task becomes then it's a little bit more complicated. And the question is how could the cell, uh, how could the cell solve this problem? This is now completely made up. This is not a real data uh, situation here, but I just made it up just to, just for, to show you how this could be done, okay? So how, do, how could the cell solve this thing? Well, one possibility would be instead of having two outputs, if you will, you have these two neurons that process in two different ways. For instance, this one, sorry, neurons, sorry, these nodes, okay, I'm already, anyway. So you have these two nodes and this node here could process the two inputs in an unlike manner, or you could have another node which processes two inputs into an uh, or-like manner, okay? So, um, or, uh, in this particular case, it would be a not and, okay? So in this case, if you have these two integration maps, a simple way out to obtain this thing would be to multiply the two maps. And this means that we have to take these two, uh, the outputs from these two nodes and bring it to a third node in an and-like way. And then we're going to have the integration map that we're looking for, okay? Anyway, this is very simple so far, and you know, you know where I'm going. So basically you have a network like this, and then you can make it more complicated if you need to, reproduce more complicated uh, behaviors by adding more neurons, more nodes to the intermediate layer. You can add an extra intermediate layer. You can add more input nodes. You can add more output nodes. And eventually you, you, we get to what, something that I'm sure that you are familiar with, which is fit forward neural networks, okay? With multiple layers, which is a, a standard, if you will, 
in uh, current machine learning uh, with some uh, with some subtleties that maybe people have be, uh, been implemented that we'll talk about or we we'll mention later. But this is the typical architecture in which you have multiple layers, and these multiple layers are extracting are extracting features from the environment, and just by uh, by some kind of a of a learning process in which you uh, you obtain the weights, the, the 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 intensities of these couplings here between the different nodes in the network. In this particular case, it could be artificial neurons. Then you can obtain a very nice classification. So I don't need to tell you from the very simple example that I gave you that this system is extremely versatile in make, in in solving these classification tasks. Okay, as far as I know, mathematically it's not been proved why. So people don't understand why, but with these deep neural networks, we can approximate any kind of a very complicated uh, uh, function uh, fitting, if you will, functional fitting. So, okay, okay then the question is, uh, do uh, cells, for instance, do biological systems such as cells have this type of architecture? And of course, we have a lot of data. So we have databases that tell us about the different biological processes such as re gene regulation. So for instance, if you go to ECOSIC, you're going to have information about what genes activate or what genes create proteins that activate other genes. And we can you can produce a network of interactions, which has a very uh, non-trivial, if you will, uh, degree distribution as this one here. And the question is, okay, what is the architecture of this network? Well, we, what you can do is you can take a look at this, uh, at this 3,000 more, a little bit more than 3,000 nodes in E. coli of these genes that are connecting with each other. And then you look at what is the architecture of this network. And what you can see is that almost all of the genes in this, uh, in this transcriptional database are connected in this kind of a fit forward manner, okay? So it seems that the, 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 this type of networks, this type of transcriptional networks are fit forward. So if that was the case, then we would be, it seems that everything is solved. So I could stop giving this talk because we could say, okay, look, this is the way the transcriptional networking in GOLI works. It's organized in a fit forward manner. And this is very good for, a, for making a complicated classification problems. But of course, the issue is that these uh, fit forward neural networks have two main problems. Problem number one, is that they have no memory of, uh, of past events in the sense that the uh, information comes through the left and then it's going to go through the network, it, it goes to the right and the, immediately the network forgets about this information. So there is no memory of past events. So this means that if we want to uh, process a dynamical information, we cannot do it with this type of architecture. Another important problem is that these networks don't scale with additional tasks. If I add another task, another image here that I want the network to distinguish between, not only these two, but maybe an elephant, if you will, then this means that I have to retrain them, the whole network and identify all the comp all the different uh, couplings, all the different weights between the different neurons. Okay, so this is what's sometimes called catastrophic interference. Okay, so we have these two problems that tells us that this cannot be the whole story. The network of regula uh, transcriptional regulation in a cell, such as a, such as a bacterium, such as E. coli has to have something else because otherwise this cell would not be able to process dynamical information, okay? With the multiple types of inputs. So how do we solve this? How do we add memory to this network? So one way of doing this will be to move from fit forward to recurrent networks, okay? So the idea is that instead of having a fit forward uh, architecture in which information is propagating from left to right and then it's being lost after a short amount of time, what, what, what could happen is that then the, uh, the nodes are connecting with each other in a recursive manner in such a way that the information enters the network and it's going to stay here for a while, okay? This would allow immediately give some memory to the network. And we will be talking about this in the next few minutes, okay? Of course, the problem is that in that case, how do you train the network? How do you determine the weights between the neurons or between the nodes in this particular, I guess it would be the genes. How would you determine the, the, the weights here in this particular case? I mean, I haven't told you this, but in machine learning, this type of networks are very easy to train because you can use, for instance, back propagation in which you first obtain these weights and then you obtain these weights and then you obtain these weights and so forth, okay? And this is relatively straightforward and it has underlied in partly the revolution in deep learning that we have witnessed in the last few years. The problem with recurrent networks is that it's not, they are not easy to train, okay? Because then this means that you can, you can no longer have layers so you cannot do back propagation. So then you have to solve the whole problem at once and this becomes complicated. Of course, machine learning researchers have been dealing with this and have found very sophisticated solutions. But my question is, how, does, how do cells do it if this is what they need to do? 
And I, and I think it's clear that they, they need to do this if they want to process information uh, in a dynamic manner, as I just told you, okay? So a few years ago, I would say almost 20 years ago, uh, several researchers, including Herbert Jaeger uh, and Wolfgang Maas, uh, published almost simultaneously a proposal in which they showed that, okay, maybe we can build a neural network, which is recurrent, and instead of having to train all the all the weights in the recurrent part of the network, maybe we can just have a recurrent part and then we can have something downstream. And this something downstream is what interprets whatever is happening here. And then if that is the case, then we only need to train that layer. And this is relatively straightforward. So in other words, we don't care at all what are the connections between the neurons in here. We just give them, take them for granted. Information comes in, this information is time dependent, it's complex. And then once we have it here, it reverberates with the rest of the network. So that's why these are called echo state networks because the networks have some kind of echo or they also call liquid state machines because uh, this is like a, a, like a surface of water in which, you, in, in which droplets of water fall. And then the information is stored in the, in, the, in the waves, in the water, in a very complicated manner. But in principle, you could have nodes downstream that can interpret this, uh, the state of this, of this recurrent core, okay? And this has been a term recently reservoir computed. So in this, the idea is, again, you have some kind of input layer, then you have a recurrent reservoir, a reservoir of nodes, uh, which are connected with each other in different ways. So you have feedback in here, and then downstream, you have the readout layer which is the fit forward layer that I was showing you earlier, as you will see in a minute, okay? So these networks can process distributed inputs, multiple multidimensional inputs. They can process temporal information and they are easy to train, okay? So this has become a paradigm. It's not, it's not tremendously efficient. Uh, so uh, machine learning uh, researchers have found out other more, research, um, other more efficient uh, architectures. But the question is that cells do not have the, uh, the, the um, the luxury of just being very specific in how you design the type of uh, architecture. So the question is, okay, this is a very simple architecture. Is this, is this realistic? So let's go back to our network, the, the E. coli network that we uh, obtained from ECOSIC. And let me show you what we have upstream of this fit forward network. And what we have upstream of the fit forward network I was telling you about is a small reservoir of genes which are coupled in a recurrent manner. So, 70 genes in the case of E. coli are connected recurrent, recursively, and then they are projecting downstream to a huge amount of fit forward, uh, fit forwardly connected net, net nodes, genes in this particular case, okay? So this means that the architecture of the uh, regulatory network of E. coli is well suited for this type of computation. And this is not only exclusive to E. coli, it also happens in other organisms, uh, such as other bacteria, such as Bacillus satellites, yeast, uh, insects, humans. So in this particular case, there is no transition in this case. So we, this, we, we could claim that this is maybe um, a common, if you will, computational paradigm that can be found uh, in the gene regulatory structure of all these different organisms at, many, at, at, at very widely different levels of evolution, okay? So the question is whether this architecture is going to be useful for processing this kind of dynamical information. So how do we test this computational capability? So make a, we can do very simple. First of all, we need to train. And then there are a standard methods of training of the, identifying these without weights. Uh, for instance, one of them is the so-called rich regression method, which is just uh, a way of uh, trying to identify the, the, the values of these weights given the, the intended uh, behavior of the output and the, and, and the real behavior of the output, okay? So by apply, applying this simple uh, calculation here, we can identify the weights. And in that way, then we can uh, make this thing uh, in principle process dynamical information at will. How, free, how efficiently? Uh, well, first of all, let me, well, how efficiently? Let's talk about this. So in order to test the efficiency, let's design a task. And uh, the typical task that the uh, uh, researchers in, machine learn, in the machine learning field are using are very complicated, but we can try to see whether cells are uh, able to perform this task. For instance, imagine that we introduce here some kind of random input. And then what we ask the reservoir is that they, uh, they are able to reproduce a very complicated function that, has, that requires memory. For instance, this is a recursive uh, function of the, uh, in which you, we have the input in here. And then you have a delay. So you see that you need to remember the past very well of the system. So then the idea is that if you have your input here, you introduce it here and perform this recursion, you're going to have a very complicated dynamics that requires uh, the system to remember the past. So it's a very stringent test 
of the ability of this type of architecture to really process information in time. And I have to tell you, we did this analysis in the past, and it works quite well for the five species that I was telling you about. If here I show you the input, which is the random input in gray, in black, you see the output of this nonlinear transformation, the target, and in color, you see the response of the network. And you can see that the, the more, uh, the more, uh, if you will, the higher the organism, if you will, if you allow me this, uh, this terminology, for instance, in the case of humans, the reservoir is so large, then we have a very good, you can even, we cannot even tell the black line here because it reproduces almost per perfectly, okay? In E. coli and bacillus, in which the reservoir is smaller, then you have a not so good reproduction, but still it's a pretty good reproduction of a task, which is very complicated, okay? Now, uh, of course, this is very artificial. So we have two artificial things. One is the training. The training is artificial because this is a complete, I mean, uh, we cannot expect cells to do this type of calculation every time. So in, in fact, what we would expect is that natural selection in our case would basically uh, determine the weights. And that would be the, the, the expectation. My, uh, researchers in machine learning are not using, as far as I know, mostly uh, evolutionary algorithms because they are not so efficient. But in the case of cells, it would be natural to assume that what's happening here is that natural selection is the one that is selecting these weights. Okay. So one way of doing this thing a bit uh, more realistic is instead the training, we would we could do it with an evolutionary algorithm. Okay. And we can take one a particular evolutionary algorithm, and, and what happens is indeed by using evolutionary uh, algorithms as training, eventually we perform as well as with the simple, the, the classical uh, analytical methods uh, that uh, machine learners are using. So you see this is here, the normalized root mean square error of our prediction uh, versus the generation. And you can see eventually we end up with the same uh, uh, error that we get with the regeneration method. Okay? So the, we can train this network using evolutionary algorithms. So which means that uh, simplistically, and natural selection would be able to obtain these uh, these weights. Okay. The second thing that is completely artificial is this kind of crazy task. Okay. This is a very uh, hard task that uh, researchers in computer engineering are using just to test that their system is working well. But maybe this is asking too much of cells. So why do we need to ask for such complicated tasks? So let's do something simpler. Well, before that, uh, before before doing this, uh, let me tell you something else. Let me consider the, the, uh, another thing that we are doing. Sorry, let me just, uh, another thing that we were doing here is that the input was unidimensional. We only have one input. It was varying in time, but we only had one input. So what happened if we have multiple inputs, okay? So if we have multiple inputs uh, like these ones here, and all of them are mechanical, the question would be, is the reservoir computing architecture able to uh, perform this classification, okay? So let me show you an example that we did in the past. So we have our E. coli reservoir in here, and then we have two inputs which are biologically realistic. One of them corresponds to the cyclic AMP response, which corresponds to glucose presence. Another one is maintenance of cell, cell quiescence, okay? So we know where these inputs are uh, uh, acting upon in the reservoir. So this input is acting upon these five nodes, this input is acting upon these uh, seven nodes. And then these nodes are in turn, they are up, acting on the, on the feedforward uh, readout layer in different places. For instance, the yellow ones are directly uh, activated by this, uh, by these uh, nodes. The blue ones are directly activated by these nodes, which are directly activated by the input. And then you have some gray uh, nodes here, which are activated by both. So the question that we were asking is, okay, can this network multiplex with a normal task? In this particular case, it would be what we call a recall task. I'm not going to enter into this, but let me show you the results. For instance, imagine that we have here this input and we introduce it only alone in this network. Since this is recurrent, it's going to be affecting all the reservoir. And this is the response of, uh, of three different outputs here in the readout layer, okay? So I have color coordinate here. Yellow would be directly uh, an, imp, uh, an output that is directly activated by targets of the input. Blue is one that is directly activated by targets of the other input. And gray, and gray is one that is activated by targets which are combined, okay? So are activated by, the, by both of these, of these nodes, both of the type of nodes, okay? And what we can see is that the, you can see here, that in the case of the yellow or the gray, the network is able to reproduce well the task, okay? 
But in the case of the blue one, even though these blue nodes are uh, mixed together in a recurrent manner in this reservoir, that we have a we don't have a good uh, response. Okay, so if we compute the normalized root mean square or with the prediction error, we can see that the yellow and the gray are responding well, and the blue not so much. Okay, this is for uh, in the case of uh, having only one input, input number one. What happens if we also add input number two? In input number two, the same thing is going to happen. And I have to emphasize, we are not uh, changing at all uh, the weights. Of course, not the ones in the reservoir, which we don't care, and neither the ones in here, okay? So we are not changing the weights between these two situations. And the network is able to detect uh, the nodes that are being affected directly by the nodes that are uh, receiving the corresponding inputs, okay? So here, here the error is small in the blue and the gray case when the input is affecting the blue nodes, okay? So this means that this network is able to multiplex dynamical inputs, okay? But still these tasks are uh, a little bit artificial, okay? Because uh, these tasks uh, are, are not the ones that we can expect a, uh, a cell to, to, uh, to uh, react to. So let's make some, let's make for some simpler tasks. For instance, what I'm gonna show you now is uh, let's consider four simple tasks. Let's assume that we have an input which affects all or part in this particular case is going to be all of the nodes in the reservoir. And we can have different types of behaviors. For, for instance, the input can grow linearly in time. It cannot change at all, or maybe it can go decrease linearly in time, or it can be even sinusoidal. And I'm going to have four readout genes, A, B, C, D. And, each, and, and the goal is to have each one of these four genes detecting each one of these four dynamical behaviors, okay? So for instance, in this particular case, so we train the network in such a way that these four genes are going to be detecting each one of these things. And in particular, in this case, what we get is that uh, readout the gene number, uh, readout gene A is going to be reproducing quite well. Uh, the, it's going to be active. This gene is going to be active when the, the reservoir is, uh, is uh, receiving this input, okay? So here you can see uh, in blue, the outcome of a three gene network. In this particular case, even a reservoir with three genes is good, is good enough to reproduce this input. Uh, the outcome of a 20 gene network is in red and the expected in input would be in, in yellow, okay? So you can see that in the case of a linear ramp with positive slope, only gene A is on, okay? So this is after the training. Now, if we have no change whatsoever and we want it B to answer, we can see that this is also the case, okay? So if we, again, I'm telling you, we are not changing the weights in between these four tasks. And we can see that in the absence of any change at all, basically B is responding. In this particular case, the three gene network is not working so well. So this is already an indication that the network, that the recurrent reservoir is not responding. It needs a minimum size, okay? But when you have a 20 gene reservoir, the response is quite good. So it discriminates quite well in the sense that this input is only uh, activating uh, gene B. The same thing for the readout uh, C when uh, uh, subject to an input that is a linear ramp with negative slope. And finally, and more inter interestingly, in my opinion, uh, when we add an oscillatory input, we can see that one of the genes, we train the gene D to respond, and indeed it responds, at least in the case of the 20 gene reservoir, okay? So this means that we can have different kinds of dynamical tasks, and these simple reservoirs with only 20 genes, for instance, can uh, respond uh, to different kinds of inputs in that manner, okay? So for that, of course, we need to have some memory. Let, let me also show you a little bit the behavior of the system in the case of the oscillatory input. So this would be the output, the value of the output genes in the in dash line. A solid line would be the expected uh, outcome, but we can see that the, at the beginning, we have some dynamical behavior, but after a while, the genes are going to respond in the desired manner. In this particular case, only the gene D is going to be active, okay? We can also quantify, okay, how sensitive this thing is to the properties of the cycle. For instance, if we vary the amplitude of the, of the oscillation, we can see that gene D is going to respond quite well in comparison with gene B, which is the one that would respond to no change. So we have a good discrimination in this particular case. And also regarding the frequency, if we vary the frequency of the input for the same weights, we can still see that there is a, 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 a wiggle room in which the system is going to respond to the gene D is going to respond to the oscillation, uh, even if the frequency changes, okay? So, okay, I'm almost done. I would like to, I'm going to spend only one more minute just telling you something else. I'm not going to give you the data, but I just wanted to go through it very quickly. There is another issue here, uh, which is uh, the distinction between short-term and long-term memory, okay? Um, so as I was telling you, short-term, the, the, these reservoirs are giving us immediately short-term memory because there is a reverberation and echo in the recurrent network. And this is enough to produce a, a temporal correlation 
that allows us to process information in time. But the other issue is what happens with long-term memory. Usually in computer science, in or, if, or in computational neuroscience, if you will, what people assume is that for long-term memory, you need a higher wire module that is separate from the recurrent network. And what I we wanted to ask is whether this is indeed the case, and I'm not going to tell you about it because I'm already almost out of time, but I just wanted to mention briefly. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to show you something that in principle, uh, we don't need in principle a hardwire module uh, in order to implement long-term memory if this system is behaving in a, in a chaotic manner. And we know that this type of networks, uh, which are recurrently connected, and we know from, for instance, the neural networks, they exhibit chaotic dynamics, okay? And in, 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 in our case, we have seen that uh, the networks that I was telling you about can be made chaotic very simply, okay? Now, I just wanted to tell you that this is indeed the case. If, uh, sorry, I just wanted to tell you that if the system behaves in a chaotic manner, there are phenomena such as generalized synchronization of chaos that tells us that if you have a chaotic system and you introduce some kind of complex drive, what you can induce is you can induce a reliable response because you can apply the same complex drive multiple times. And even in the presence of noise, you're going to have always the same response. So if you apply this complex drive once, you're going to have a complex response. If you, if you apply it again, you're going to have another complex response. It's also going to be complex, but it's also going to be the same. So you see that there is a reliability in the response of this chaotic system to a complex signal. And this is due to the phenomenon of generalized synchronization of chaos, okay? Uh, so, and this we can classify as a long-term memory because our network, if it's faced with the same type of complex input, multiple, uh, multi, at multiple instances, it's going to respond always in the same manner. We did this, uh, we, we identified this in, uh, in, this, in the network of C elegance. I'm not going to go into details. We moved from gene networks to neural networks and we did the analysis and we saw that the neural network of C elegance has this kind of reservoir architecture again. We can do that because the network of C elegance is very well uh, uh, defined and very well mapped with only 300 neurons. Uh, so um, we did this analysis and we saw that in this particular case, the system behaved in a chaotic manner as we expected. And in that case, and I'm going to stop already, you can see that if you apply the same kind of input, it doesn't need to be complex, but as long as the dynamics is complex, then you have multiple trials. And when you apply the same trial multiple times, the correlation between different applications is going to be larger than the correlation uh, than the, the correlation between res different responses along the same series, okay? So we can quantify this and we can see that the response of the network is reliable, which indicates that this network naturally uh, exhibits properties of long-term memory, okay? So with that, I'm going to stop. These are the take home messages that I would like to uh, share with you today. So I have shown you that gene regulatory networks have a recurrent core in many multiple species. This architecture allows for reservoir-based computations. And what this means is that complex time varying inputs applied to a cell are continuously being integrated with the dynamical state of the, of the, of the network. And in that way, the system can reproduce uh, complex dynamical information. So let me thank the people involved in this. Uh, so the last uh, results that I was showing you were done by Miguel Luengo and Leila Cavabi. And recently, Sol Vidal has joined us in continuing with this work. And the rest of the results are done by a, a variety of people that have been in the, working in the lab for several years. Marcel Gavalda, Miguel Ángel Casal, Santi Galeya, Carmen Fuentes, Anton Lamarca, Emilia Cubustaite, and also with collaboration with Lucas Caray, who is now at Pekin University, and Oscar Villarroya from Umi. So anyway, thank you so much, and I'm ready for any questions that you might have. Thank you. No, nope, I don't know. Santi, if you are... I cannot hear you. Maybe it's me. Hello? We can hear you. We can hear you. <laughs> Anti, we cannot hear you. Yeah. Now? No, you have I, a... No, I think I there think... is a problem with the sound because I am listening to yeah. some strange... Yes, some beating. You have yeah. some beating, yeah. Santi. Okay, so, okay, don't worry. Um, I will take the word because Santi has some technical problem. Okay, so there are a lot of questions. Um, let me see which is the first one. Okay, uh, by Bly, uh, do you have any insight of how this structure could arise from evolution? It is the generative algorithm. 
Okay, that's a great question. Um, um, okay, I mean, what I would like to say is that, uh, first of all, um, if you will, okay, one of, one of the conclusions that we can extract from the from the from these results and in fact from the reservoir computing community in general i haven't mentioned this is that uh, the the reservoir doesn't need to be very well structured so in fact people working in machine learning they are operating with random reservoirs okay so the connectivity in the in the reservoir is completely random which means that in principle uh, it's relatively this would be a, a situation that it would be easy to obtain a uh, evolutionary and the thing is that I, I don't know Bly, if you're thinking of what would happen with the downstream nodes in the readout um, I would like to claim that we show by just using a very simplistic genetic algorithm that these networks can be entrained so first of all the part of the reservoir is in principle in my opinion relatively easy for evolution to find because you don't need any specific architecture as long as it's random if you will uh, and then the the, the the downstream feed forward part uh, we can train uh, um, uh, weight by weight if you will so it, in principle it's doable okay we still hear santi's beating yeah this is some very strange sound. So, do you have your? I think I destroyed uh, my my dog destroyed his computer. Okay, so okay, let's try to resist to this to this uh, noise. Okay, so another question by Josep Josep Mercadal. My stall, Jordi, uh, so related to Bly's question, do you think that this kind of network architectures are necessary traits for living systems? In other words, does evolution inevitably generate these kinds of structures so that optimal information processing becomes a trademark of living systems? Or do you think other possibilities might also be possible? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Josep, also a very nice question. Uh, yeah, uh, I think, um, I wouldn't want to say that this is some kind of, of epiphenomenon, but I think, in my opinion, this is a, an, easy, an easy target for evolution. I'm telling you, because you just need this kind of a random, a small collection of genes that are randomly coupled. And this gives the system an, an amazing a capability of information processing, just tailoring the, the, the readout the, the nodes. Okay, so I wouldn't say, first of all, I, I'm not sure if you, what we call optimal information processing. If you ask uh, somebody working in machine learning, they will tell you that the reservoirs are not optimal. Or optimal. Okay, so they, uh, I, don't, I don't think that uh, many people in the computer engineering community are, are pursuing reservoir computers as, a, as an alternative. So for instance, to long short-term memory networks that people are using nowadays, because they are much more optimal. Okay, but the problem is that they are engineered. So they are highly non-trivial. I wouldn't expect that evolution would, would fall upon a long short-term memory network by chance. But I think it would be very simple for evolution to fall upon a simple random reservoir. Uh, how optimal it is, I think this, this kind of architecture is optimal enough for, for to, be, to be useful. Uh, because it's very it's very flexible, so I think it's a natural target for evolution. So I'm not sure if it's a necessity. There was another another question you said before by Miguel Roman. Yeah, yeah, I, I missed it. Sorry. So a question by Miguel Roman: Is there an optimal network structure that maximizes this memory capability? Yeah. Okay. My answer, and I haven't shown you this. Maybe I could show it to you. I think I have it somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. Sorry. Uh, oh, one sorry, one second. Oh my goodness, no! I need to show you something. One second. Um, Don't worry. I need to show you this. Uh, can I do that again? I'm going to share in a second. Oh my goodness! Share screen. Share this. I haven't shown you this type of data, but we did analyze uh, what happens with regarding the prediction error when we change the number of nodes in the different species, for instance. Uh, and what you can see here in the different dots are the, the real networks that we can obtain from the databases. And what you can see in the color, in the color lines, in particular in, the, the, in, this, uh, in this brown or whatever, this, sorry for the colors here, but this line here corresponds to a random network, okay? So this is a random network. So if you will, and you can see here that the random network is always the optimal. So my answer to Miguel is that the optimal uh, structure will be a random network. Uh, and the, the thing is that uh, uh, real, uh, real networks that we see in nature are close to random. That's the point. Okay, Santi, I think that now your microphone is working well. Hola, hola, hola. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. 
Okay. Okay. If you want, I, I go on with the with the questions. Okay. Yeah, because I don't see them now in the chat. On okay. There. So yeah, uh, the next question by Alfonso Jaramillo. Uh, nice talk. What are the most sensitive kinetic parameters in a recurrent gene network that could play the role of weights, promoter rates? Yeah. Yeah. I would say uh, you could of course play with the. I think you could play with both the thresholds for activation of the promoter and the maximum expression rate. We didn't find any. We didn't find any any clear parameter that was much better than the other. So in principle, this is flexible. So we can tune the threshold of activation or the <clears throat> or the expression rate. Yeah. Okay. And the last question, by, uh, from Ricardo. I wonder what kind of computational processes may be favored by evolution when dealing with single cell, and neural systems versus multicellular neural agents. Uh, when dealing with, sorry, I don't, let's see, when dealing with single cells versus, oh, okay, you, you mean comparing single cell with multicellular, okay? Single cell and neural versus multicellular and neural. Um, uh, I don't know, I would think, so, okay, uh, Ricard, I think this would be, it would be very nice to discuss this because the possibility, okay, first of all, what I, what I think is that if we are talking about genetic networks in a cell, which is a target for evolution per se. I think it is the simplest solution for a, for a single cell, a neural system, in my opinion, would be, would be this kind of reservoir strategy that I was telling you about. I guess what you're implying is that when we have multicellular neural agents, then we have other solutions. And I agree that this could be possible. I agree this could be possible. Um, I still think that when, I mean, I don't know, I can, I can only tell you that when we looked at C elegance, the architecture was also there. Okay, we had the reservoir and we had the fit, uh, we had the, the readout, which was fit forward. So it is also there, of course. Again, I don't know what happens when you go from the worm to the human. Okay, so we, when you go from three hundred neurons to 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 10, 10 million neurons or whatever, uh, so probably there you do have transitions which uh, give rise to a different computational paradigms. This is for sure. But I still think the same way that the brain is basically a fossil. And then we still get the, the, for the, the basic uh, computational architectures and we are still using them for, for some tasks. I still think that the same thing is happening in, 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 human, in, in the brain. I mean, of course, I mean, in the cortex, we have this layer structure, so which means uh, with some recurrences, uh, which indicates that probably the human cortex is much more sophisticated and probably it's closer to implementing solutions that people in machine learning have come up with. Uh, but uh, yeah, this could happen. But I mean, if you have very simple organisms and they don't need to be bacteria, it can also be a worm. It seems that this is a very good solution. Well, thank you. Thanks. Okay, Santi, are you there? Okay. So thanks so much, Jordi, for this really amazing thank you. talk. You are really amazing things. And thanks yeah, thank you, uh, thank to all of, yeah. Okay, Santi is here, okay, no problem. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so now we will make the break and uh, if you don't mind, we will be back at 12. Okay, we have uh, almost 15 minutes for taking a coffee, okay? So see you at 12. Okay, perfect, okay. thanks you, sir. Thank you so much, see you. Thanks. Talk. Yeah, Cristina uh, did a PhD in bioinformatics uh, in Trinity College, Dublin, and then she did a number of postdocs uh, in Europe, in different places, and then up here in Valencia, in our institute. And now she's, uh, she just got a position as CSIC associate professor, and is going to start uh, that position soon. She has been working on the role of uh, genome duplications um, the, in the origin of new functions. And uh, it's combining bioinformatics, as I said, and experimental evolution with yeast and bacteria. So, Chris, Christina, whenever you are ready. Perfect. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. Let me see you. Let me share the screen. And the share screen is where? 
options can go into the facilities. Is there no option of sharing screen? Uh, compartir. I see something which is say compartir. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Security, no. Oh, here we go. Share screen. Let me find it. Uh, with all the desktop I have in front. Here we go. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, perfect. Presentation. You have to swap this place, I guess, or use a slideshow because we are seeing uh, the presentator mode. And show. Let me just change the. Many things open. Okay. Um, sorry about this. No, you enter in presentation mode as you were. In presentation, but then when yeah. presentation mode, it goes here instead. And then, and then in the top uh, left corner, you have a thing that says use a slideshow or that one. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so, well, sorry about this. Uh, so, thank you for the invitation. Um, as Santi said, I'll do probably a bit more biological oriented talk um, as I'm going to be talking about duplicates and the involvement in switching in the metabolics in uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And so, obviously, we all know about evolution and how the Darwin's principle of descent says that innovation occurs. Uh, through the modification of pre-existing genes or functions, uh, and these are often um, modified due to uh, mutations in either the coding and the regulatory um, regions. And if we just look at the fitness landscape, then we're looking at the fitness of how the population is, or well, our cells uh, on the um, y-axis and then we can kind of walk and we have mutations and these can either increase the fitness of the um, of our cell or it can decrease and in most cases it'll actually decrease the, the fitness of um, our cells. So then you go then what is uh, how will uh, innovation and function actually emerge and um, there you're going to need some kind of mechanisms that will allow for the accumulation of the mutations which are often uh, deleterious and this is uh, often through um, mutational robustness. So mechanisms that allow for deleterious mutations to actually um, accumulate uh, within the genomes. And uh, if we, I'm just showing here three such mechanisms and these can be molecular chaperons. So deleterious mutations will often uh, destabilize the 3D structure of our proteins. So uh, what the molecular chaperons do is that they take our uh, proteins and they uh, make sure that they get into the right uh, three-dimensional conformation. And we can also think about uh, adapt uh, co-adaptive uh, mutations. Uh, so if you have a deleterious mutation, then you can add on that destabilizes the, the protein, but then you have another uh, mutation that will go in and stabilize um, the mutation, thereby uh, stabilizing the protein. Uh, another way is actually gene duplication, um, and it's probably the chief mechanism, as you would have as a general, the kind of my very simplistic way of looking at gene duplication is that you always have this ancestral gene, you're always going to have one of your genes that will have the ancestral function and you have this new gene that is free to explore um, your um, new variations and um, in your fitness landscape, so uh, it's free to evolve. So gene duplication can occur on very many levels. So these can be either genes or clusters of genes, or it's been segments or whole chromosomes or the genome. Um, if we look at um, some of the evidence that this is really a very profound mechanism to generate 
a huge evolutionary leap since, for example, uh, we've seen this in all kingdoms of life, for example, in plants, for the angiosperms of the flowering plants, we had a whole genome duplication event around 150 or 140 million years ago. And we're also seeing it in animals where whole genome duplication events are linked to huge events such like the development of the big brains or jaws or um, radiance of fish. But we're also seeing it in microbes such as saccharomyces, where you are having uh, the whole genome duplication event, which occurred around 100 million years ago, uh, where you're getting um, the creation of the fermentation processes. Um, so newer formed uh, duplicates can also have um, an ad adaptive um, advantage for the organisms, uh, which is some of the things that we looked at lately. Uh, for example, uh, in a paper from um, two years ago, is where we're looking at uh, fully ploidy, but only on one chromosome. And here at the chromosome three in uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And what we actually observe is that the fitness, the relative, which is measured in the relative growth rate, here um, is different depending on if you have only one. So in these cases, it's mostly diploid uh, organisms. So if you're only having one uh, chromosome three, you're having a reduced relative growth rate, where when you're actually adding uh, here, having an extra chromosome, so you're suddenly having a better growth rate. So you can have adaptive uh, mechanisms um, with uh, animal ploidy. In other ways, what you can actually do is uh, hybridization. So these are hybridization events that occur between uh, relatively closely related species, but they are different species. And obviously, as soon as you are uh, combining different species, you will have um, the potential of gaining um, the properties of both parents. Um, so this is a really a great way of how adaptation, but often hybrid genomes are really unstable. Um, but what we observed in a paper from last year is that this instability that these genomes have uh, when they first stabilize, um, this process of stabilization is can be really adaptive uh, for these organisms. So if we look at what happens with duplicates is that obviously we know of selection and the natural selection would often actually get rid of one of the copies because it's quite expensive to have two copies, uh, two genes doing the same thing. So what we need is we're going to have, uh, this can be duplication, so it can either be a cell duplication or it can be hybridization or whatever, but we're having two genes doing the same thing. And for um, the genome to actually keep, to have the genome keeping both of the copies, we need them to diverge in some way. This can either be um, by regulation. So if we're thinking about higher eukaryotes, it can either be that uh, these proteins are now expressed in different tissues or different time points or other things, or they can diverge uh, functioning. So if we're just looking at what actually happens is that you're duplicating the gene, you can then, in most cases, as I said, these will lead to nose prioritization because you accumulate a lot of mutations. And in most cases, these mutations are actually deleterious. So over time, one of the copies uh, will become um, non functionalized and will be lost. Uh, you can have the uh, conservancy, which uh, will often be, might the function be the same, but the regulatory regions would have changed. In other, the, you can also have one of the copies, which is what we most of the time we think about when we're doing duplications, is that one will actually gain a new uh, function, so a neural functionalization, uh, or you can have some kind of partitioning of the um, the function of the ancestral function within the two different copies for the sub functionalization, or you can have a specialization that's going on. But when we talk about duplication, there's different um, mechanisms in which the as I talked about, that they can occur at different levels. And obviously, the different level get different um, constraints on the evolution or um, so on. So for example, for the whole genome duplication, you will you duplicate the whole genome. It's going to be self-duplication or by hybridization, where the two um, parent species are, are quite close to each other. Um, and you're keeping the stromatic uh, balance in the between the thing because you're duplicating the whole thing. So you're having the dosage, uh, the dosage balance is the same and the interaction network, so everything are the same. Um, so this makes it relatively stable and you're having you're generating a huge amount of um, diversity and you can you have a lot of material to actually uh, innovate. However, um, 
this also gives some kind of constraints because you have so many constraints already. Uh, where when you're looking at the small scale duplicates, these are only uh, duplication of genes or groups of genes uh, of Iran or whatever. Um, there you're having the dosage balance that is, is not optimal anymore. Um, uh, and you have less material, but this you don't have the same kind of constraints on it. So another way of looking at it is that we're having, this is a paper that we have from a few years ago, where we are looking at or these are genes or functional genes, and we're looking at how they're interacting, so then through the whole genome duplication event, we are duplicating the whole thing. So obviously, as we are going through, some of the copies will be uh, removed because simply due to natural selection. Um, what we'll have in, in many cases, we'll have the soft specialization going on. So you're missing some of the, you're removing some of the copies and you're still retaining um, this interaction that you have in the function between the, your proteins. Or you can have an evolutionary dead end where you're suddenly missing some of the things that you actually need um, for this. Another thing is the small scales is where you're duplicating the A. Uh, it's only one thing that is being duplicated and they are now sharing the interactions. Um, but since you always have the, the um, the ancestral copy one of them, then the other one is more freely to actually explore uh, new functions and you will in many cases uh, lose some of the ancestral functions in during this process. And the model organisms that we're using for this is Saccharomyces cerevisiae because it's a really, really um, nice organism to do it in, uh, especially because uh, of it containing a whole genome duplication event that occurred, as I said, 100 million years ago. Um, and uh, is currently well, 90, around 92% of GNCs return to single copy, so it's around uh, 550 uh, pairs of duplicates that are retained in the, in the genome of the Saccharomyces. Um, and on top of that, they also have a more or less the same number of uh, small scale duplicates uh, within the genomes. Uh, and since we're doing experimental evolution, it's really nice that these are easy to grow, um, they grow fast. Uh, they have high mutation rates, so we can accumulate mutations uh, relatively quickly. They're easy to manipulate. And then obviously they are eukaryotes, which means that they can be models for higher eukaryotes. So the information that we get here can be for, um, can be for higher eukaryotes as well. So the experiment that we kind of have been setting up that we're working on, so this is a work in progress, is that uh, we want to see what happens when we actually change the metabolism. So yeast often grow on uh, glucose, and what we want to do is actually to force them to work um, to grow on other carbon sources such as ethanol or uh, glycerol or lactic acid. Um, we then, obviously here we're changing the carbon source, then we're changing uh, the metallic uh, pathways in which uh, carbon is taken up by our organism. And we will then check for the fitness, how the fitness um, is affected. Uh, of their populations, and we also we're going to look at how the genes have changed in, in their expression. And we're also going to do some um, uh, DNA, so looking at the mutations. However, I will talk about that today. I'm just going to focus on the other two. We'll do some um, experimental evolution over time, uh, and then reconsider and, and reevaluate what is actually going on uh, in our populations, since we want to look at both the what's happening at some kind of acute state when they're changing the carbon source, but also at a more chronic um, state. Um, so what we start off with is a single uh, colony. Um, since so we know what kind of the material is, the, the DNA that we start off with, we, we know um, how the genome looks at the start. Um, so what we want to do in the beginning is actually diversify, uh, since you don't have much diversification, since you're coming from a single colony. Um, and what we evaluate then with uh, transcriptomics and with our some fitness. Um, and I just will, and the fitness of how we will, uh, how your fitness is often uh, evaluated uh, with these is that obviously you're looking at the biomass and how the biomass changes over time, so it's stuff off growing quite slowly, and then you're going through some exponential phase, and then you have some slow growth at the end, um, and then you're having um, this logistic um, uh, equation that will kind of, you can 
get the information out of, of, for example, the carrier capacity. So how much is the capacity of our populations to grow over the time? And um, many people also look at um, our new max, which is actually the, the R factor of the ratio of how quickly is this, this in this log phase when the, you know, this exponential phase where they're actually growing the most. Um, so this is um, what we look at. Um, so what I said is so we're diversifying our population and this comes from you going through these bottlenecks because we're really uh, going through uh, when you're having huge bottlenecks and you are forcing the accumulation of the mutations over time. And this is a paper that we had from uh, 14 uh, where we're doing uh, clonal populations and not uh, liquid populations that we're doing right now. So in this experiment, we are passing a single clone each day uh, to the next um, to a new fresh place. So we're accumulating mutations through animals ratchet. Um, and when we're looking at the results here, it's just as I explained, uh, the growth, so the OD, so the, the mu max, is that obviously we, uh, if we're looking at the mutations that are uh, accumulating in our clonal populations, is that the synonymous mutations, or the mutations that do not change amino acids, kind of flatten out a bit. But what is really interesting is that the non-synonymous mutations, so the mutations that are uh, changing our amino acids, keep on um, increasing. And that is really interesting when we're looking at our fitness. So as expected, our populations, these clonal populations are actually, um, the fitness of these are declining because most of the mutations are deleterious. However, at a certain point, we start getting um, probably what is compensatory mutations. And um, what we're talking about deleterious mutations, obviously, so deleterious mutations might be deleterious within this environment, but if you take it to some other environment that this mutation might actually be advantageous. So we're looking for acceptations. So in a recent paper, we actually observed this one, we are looking at our mu max, um, where we are looking at growth in YPD. So this is in, uh, glucose and in ethanol, which are the orange ones. And what we observe is so we're growing, this is T0, um, and then at T100, so after 100 days of passaging in liquid media, is what we actually observe is that we're having um, a better fitness in um, YPD, so in uh, glucose, which is kind of what we will say adapted, is more adapted to this, but we actually are observing an acceptation as well. So we're seeing that the ethanol uh, growth here um, has increased in this line A2, which indicate that we might actually have an acceptation and it will be really interesting uh, at some point to actually look at the genome to see if we can, we can see something here. Um, but so what we, uh, obviously, as I said, we want to look at, we're diversifying our populations and we want to look at not just acute, but also a more chronic, uh, exposure or change of carbon source. So we do uh, another 10 passages uh, of growing in these um, uh, new carbon sources and we reevaluate the, the transcriptomic, so the changes of uh, the expression of our genes and again, the fitness. Um, so if we just do a quick uh, check of the core genes. So these are the core genes that we see at all three time points and changes for all the three stressors. Um, these are just a quick uh, gene ontology um, expression of what's going on. And they obviously the enrichment analysis done by uh, what is normally being done by the hypergenetic uh, distribution, which looks at um, our uh, background and uh, what is annotated for the GO at, at that time point and our deregulated uh, proteins uh, for our lists. Um, and, and since all these are different stressors and different time points, um, the observations that we actually observe is uh, quite uh, expected since these are oxidative reduction processes um, and other things like that. Um, but as I said, what we really want to look at is how are these ancient duplicates, how are they actually involved in um, this changing process of when they change the, the carbon source. So we look at, uh, here we're looking at the fraction of genes that are being deregulated. 
Um, I'm just showing you all here. Obviously, we have a lot more singletons. Uh, we have around 4,000, a bit more than 4,000 genes that are singletons, and then the duplicates, each of the sets of duplicates, around 1,100 duplicates. So this um, difference in size. And so obviously, we have to look at the fraction instead. Um, and proportionally, we're actually seeing a lot more duplicates are proportionally are um, reacting to our stresses, and particular for the down regulation of genes. Um, it's really the duplicated genes that are the ones that are reacting to our new carbon source. Um, and in many cases, especially in the ethanol, it's actually the whole genome duplicates that are the ones that are um, reacting uh, rather than our small scale duplicates. And putting that into context, um, we also need to think about that obviously the the function of each of the the function that can actually evolve through um, these duplication events are different if you're looking at whole genome duplicates compared to small scale duplicates so it kind of makes sense that it's kind of like the sugar transporters and stuff like that that are for the um, small scale duplicates for what we're having here is uh, this paper from 2007 where these are enrichment uh, functions for duplicated genes. And over here, they're just plotting the, the blue ones are the whole genome duplicates and the red ones are the small scales. And we are seeing that they are, the functions in which they're, they're involved in are, are not overlapping that much, which kind of makes sense, right? Um, so Another thing that we really wanted to look at is that obviously when you're having two duplicated genes, then the transcriptional uh, diversion that you have between them, so they are often either functionally or and or uh, diverge in, um, in transcriptional levels. So we are um, kind of coming up with this of if they are transcriptionally diverged, we say if they are transcribed with a difference of 25% of each other. Um, we said that these are transcriptionally diverse. So if we look at, oops, so what we're actually looking at here is the, the fractions um, for each of them at our three times points. So the T0 and the T100 for our um, acute um, exposure where the T110 is more the, uh, the chronic state of, of changes. Um, and what we see is that um, you're having a lot more genes that are diverse that are the ones that are actually reacting to our um, exposure or change in our carbon sources. Um, and specifically, again, for uh, ethanol compared to, for example, the lactic acid, we'll still have quite a lot of um, genes that are depending on that they are actually um, more transcriptional diverge between the two duplicated copies. Um, for the ones that are reacting, not so much for the, the glycerol, and these can be due to the different pathways that they're actually targeting. Um, so um, what we also looked at is not just if they are transcriptionally diverse, but also if we're looking at the magnitude of difference. Um, so we do resampling uh, with the non-replacement uh, for the mean uh, transcriptional diversions of these. And we do these for our three time points. And we look at, at the up regulation or the down regulations at the three time points. We do the, do the calculation of the transcriptional divergence for either at T0, which should kind of be our clonal populations, but we also recalculate this um, for our two uh, points later on just to see if there's a difference in the transcriptional divergence between uh, or over time. And actually what we observe uh, both in um, the ethanol and in the lactic is actually if you're looking, for example, at the orange one here, which is the T110, is that these become more significant uh, when you're looking at the specific time uh, for the calculation. Um, so at the time of you actually doing uh, our experiment, which should indicate that the transcriptional background in which uh, you're exposing um, this change of uh, carbon source uh, has some kind of influence on what kind of genes are actually the ones that um, are reacting. Um, so it's not just, so it's a, a question, probably a question about uh, both the function, but maybe not always the gene, but also the transcriptional background that is um, at the time. 
um, and then just a quick summary uh, on the take, uh, home, take home message here is just that ancient duplicate genes are um, transcriptionally rewired during the metabolic uh, switching. And these are particularly the whole genome duplicates, which is probably because of um, their function that they often are involved in uh, for the down recognition. Um, and also that the transcriptional background can, can change really quickly and influence which genes are the ones that are responding to our stress. Um, and that obviously over time that these have really been involved in huge generation of innovation, but they actually continue on to um, be involved in the response and the adaptation um, further on. And then just a quick uh, one of the acknowledgements. Uh, obviously, my collaborators uh, in many of these, there's been uh, papers over the years. So it's also for my AMBO fellowship from many years ago and then for the other institutions. And thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Christina. Um, time for questions. Uh, I don't see any right now in the chat. Mm. Okay, so uh, uh, do you one question? Do you think, Christina, that uh, if you run the same experiments using another uh, bit more complex system like eukaryotic cells, I mean mammalian cells, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, you will get similar results, or the complexity of the genome uh, itself determines what is the so how the, what is the outcome of the of the uh, evolution experiments? Things become really complicated when you start talking about multicellularity because you're having this extra complexity of not just sensing like you have developmental and the different tissues and, and things become mm -hmm. really complex. I think, um, but it could be really interesting to see to actually check what's going on in the different tissues. And, yes, I can. Mm -hmm. And, and what about uh, things like epigenetic regulation and things like that? Have you ever considered exploring them? That could be super interesting. And I, I think really one should, that is something that is needed to be looked at. Um, because I think it's where the, it, it's becoming more and more obvious that this is really important thing. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, if there is no more questions uh, arriving, uh, thanks again, Christina, for the talk. Uh, yep. uh, so we are done for, for this morning. And we'll be back at uh, 3. And Josep will take over the, the, the chairing the session. No, Josep? Yes. Okay. So see you all, the, uh, all after lunch. Bye.